Reproduction is a biological process by which new individual organisms of species are produced from their parents. Reproduction is a fundamental feature of all known life. Each individual organism exists as a result of reproduction. There are two, for, there are two forms of reproduction, sexual and asexual. Types of reproduction, sexual recurs two parent organisms, asexual recurs one parent organisms. Sexual sperm plus egg fertilize one another to form a zygote. Asexual, the single organism, makes a copy of itself and divides. The offspring are genetically unique from the parents, but contain a random combination of a parental genes. Asexual, the offspring are genetically identical to the parents. Sexual, used by humans, other animals and plants. Asexual, used by yeast, sponges and bacteria. Sexuals produce genetically different babies, increasing the survival rate of the population but requires a lot of time and effort. Asexual reproduction process extremely efficient, but if the parent has genetic defects, deficiencies, all of its offspring could also be weak. Parthenogenesis is an asexual reproduction. There are also types of asexual reproduction, fission, budding, vegetative reproduction, spore formation, fragmentation, and parthenogenesis. Where its name came from? The name itself came from the Greek words Parthenos or virgin and Genesis or creation. Parthenogenesis means virgin creation. What is parthenogenesis? Parthenogenesis is a form of asexual production in which growth and development of embryos occur without fertilization. In animals, parthenogenesis means development of an embryo from an unfertilized egg cell and is a component process of apomixis. How normal fertilization and parthenogenesis differ? Normal fertilization, precursor egg cell divides into four, three cells discarded, one become egg, egg is first fertilized with sperm, baby shark created with one set of chromosomes from each parent, virgin birth parthenogenesis, precursor egg cell divides, three cells discarded, egg doubles and divides genetic material, cells and genome combine two sets of identical chromosomes from mother to create shark. Parthenogenesis can be seen in insects, cross stations, rodifers, transforms, snails, reptiles, amphibians, sharks, and birds. And by the way, I will add a little detail that my friend Ejat here forgot to add. So this is big split. Parthenogenesis is not to be confused with hermaphrodite species, which can also reproduce by themselves. Applied and deployed. Asexual and sexual reproduction. Parthenogenesis is one of the powerful examples about the asexual reproduction. Here you can see a diagram about asexual and sexual reproduction. Haploid parthenogenesis. What is haploid? A single set of chromosomes has the full set of genetic material present in the egg and sperm cells of animals and in the egg of and pollen cells of the plants. What is haploid parthenogenesis? Some species undergo haploid parthenogenesis after chromosomal reduction has already occurred. Here, progeny arise from haploid eggs and turn into haploid individuals. This is seen in male honeybees and some flowering plants. It is rarer than diploid parthenogenesis. Haploid parthenogenesis is known as facultative parthenogenesis also. Facultative parthenogenesis is the term for what occurs when a species that normally reproduces sexually undergoes a sexual reproduction. This is in the contrast to obligate parthenogenesis, where the females reproduce exclusively by asexual means. Diploid parthenogenesis. What is diploid? Diploid is a cell or organism that has paired chromosomes, one from each parent. In humans, cells other than human sex cells are diploid and have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Human sex cells, egg and sperm cells, contain a single set of chromosomes and are known as haploid. Diploid parthenogenesis. Diploid parthenogenesis in whiptail lizards. You can see this diagram about whiptail lizards. It's parthenogenesis. What is diploid parthenogenesis? Normal egg cells form after meiosis and are haploid, with half as many, many chromosomes as their mother's body cells. Haploid individuals, however, are usually non viable and parthenogenetic offspring usually have diploid chromosome numbers. Depending on the mechanism involved in the restoring the diploid number of chromosomes, parthenogenetic offspring may have anywhere between all and half of the mother's allowed. Those springs having all of the mother's genetic material are called full clones, and those having only half are called half clones. Full clones are usually formed without meiosis. 
If myosis occurs, the offspring will get only a fraction of the mother's alleles. Diploid partenogenesis is much more common than haploid partenogenesis and is known in insects such as the galvas and also in the roundworms and flukes, as well as in the various flowering plants such as the dandelion. Thank you for listening. In our history of the partenogenesis, if we had to talk about just three persons, if we had to choose a big three, certainly our big three would be Charles Bonnet, Jack Wolf, and Gregor Pincus. So let's start from the bottom and take a look at what, when, and why they did. Charles Bonnet. That's them. <laughs> Charles Bonnet was a naturalist and philosopher in the mid 18th century. His most important contribution to embryology was the discovery of partenogenesis in aphids, proving that the sexual reproduction was obsolete, was possible. As you can guess, what Bonnes observed was some natural way of partenogenesis. Now, our historical story leads us to a very different point and a very important person, Jack Love. That's the <clears throat> Jack Love was a German born born American physiologist and biologist. After Bonnet's discovery in the 18th century, Jacob experimented on embryos in Europe and the United States at the end of 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Lab study sea urchins. His method for artificial partenogenesis was to place sea urchin eggs in a solution of salt water that had higher osmotic pressure than seawater. Later, removing the eggs and rinsing them with seawater, then finally leaving them in seawater. Once back in normal seawater, many of the eggs developed into glassol, gastrol, and platy. At the end of his report about his experiments, Lop hypothesized that spermatozoa contained more salts or had a higher osmotic pressure than eggs. When a spermatozoa entered an egg, entered in an egg, it brought about the same chemical reactions as artificial means. In both cases, water evacuated the egg, which then developed. This is a seawater. Artificial partenogenesis supplies the appropriate conditions for an animal to reproduce without a partner. So Jack Love tried to supply these conditions for a bunch of animals. Some of them succeed, some of them not. To Love, artificial partenogenesis was anything but easy. Well, his experiment was at the early 20th century. In 21st century, biologists are still not able to explain partenogenesis clearly, so I think he made a good point. So we talked about the early history of the partenogenesis. From this very moment, I can say that we left early history of the partenogenesis behind. We are going to talk about the person who made modern experiments and developments about this subject, and it's Gregory Goodwin Pincus. That's them. I love you the most. Dr. Pincus began studying hormonal biology and steroidal, steroidal hormones early in his career. He was interested in the way that hormones affected mammals' reproductive systems, his first breakthrough came early, when he was able to produce in vitro fertilization in Revison, 1934. In 1936, he published his discoveries after his experiments. After this first experiment of partenogenesis in one of mammals, rabbit, the subject became important. Lastly, as you could hear about, that biologists are still working partenogenesis in mammals or even humans. And that was it. Thank you. Partenogenesis in honeybees. Honeybees are able to reproduce without fertilization, although the purpose of the partenogenesis reproduction is slightly different than in other animals. The queen bee only mates once during her lifetime, although she may mate with many male bees during that time. According to Masana and Carta, the sperm is used to fertilize some of her eggs, which will become female worker bees. Her unfertilized eggs will grow into bees with partenogenesis and will all be male drones. So these are queen bees. Uh, <laughs> the way honeybees reproduce. While partenogenesis may sound like an odd or rare event in nature, it's actually the preferred form of reproduction for many species. Honeybees, for example, are able to sustain their population only through the ability of unfertilized eggs to develop. In honeybee colonies, the fertilized eggs become females and the unfertilized eggs will develop into male drones. This is the process known as haploid partenogenesis. The unfertilized egg has only half the number of chromosomes of a fertilized egg. The haploid bee will have the sex chromosomes, X0, which causes the bee to become a male drone. Female bees have twice the number of chromosomes with two X chromosomes to induce the development of female worker bees or a queen if sufficient nutrition is provided to the larva. 
Honeybee colonies that lack a male drum will eventually die out, as all of the larvae produced by the queen will be haploid and develop into drums. This is known, this is known as a drum brood, and the bee colony will degenerate and collapse without a sufficient supply of female worker bees. Another, another way that drum broods form is when the colony lacks a breeding queen. The worker bees are unable to mate and will not typically produce young. In the absence of a fertile queen, however, the worker bees will begin producing eggs. These eggs are not fertilized and will, not, will produce only male honeybees. These colonies are also doomed to collapse, which means they are going to degenerate and uh, will no longer exist. So these are some pictures of uh, bees. This is a worker bee, this is the queen bee, and this is a drum, this is male. And these are two females. Uh, they look slightly different than each other. And this is a diagram. This is a queen bee. Uh, her fertilized egg is diploid and beca becomes female offspring. And her unfertilized egg is haploid, uh, which becomes male offspring, which is the parthenogenesis. And this is an interesting fact. It's actually a fact. A few ants and bees are capable of producing diploid female offspring parthenogenetically. These include the honeybee subspecies from South Africa, Epis mellifera capensis, where workers are capable of pro producing diploid eggs parthenogenetically and replacing the queen if she dies. Other examples include some species of, of small carpenter bee, uh, genus Sertina. Many parasitic wasps are known to be parthenogenetic, sometimes due to infections by Wolbachia. Another uh, picture of a queen worker and a drum, and this is another a diagram uh, which means the same thing. This is parthenogenesis. And thank you very much for this. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about parthenogenesis in different kinds of animals. Um, crustacean uh, reproduction varies both across and between species. species. Among the better known large decapod uh, crustaceans, some crayfish reproduce by parthenogenesis. Uh, Mammy crabs are parthenogenetic crayfish. In mammy crabs, uh, offsprings are genetically identical to the parents, which shows they are reproduced by apomixis and the eggs don't undergo meiosis. Spinachi can reproduce both sexually and by parthenogenesis. This is a mammy crab. And this is a spiny cheek crayfish, and they are both love. Uh, Rotifers also reproduce by parthenogenesis. In some of uh, the rotifers, females reproduce exclusively by parthenogenesis, while in others, females can alternate between sexual and asexual reproduction. Okay. This is a rotifer that's really, really tiny. And reptiles. Most reptiles reproduce sexually, but parthenogenesis occurs naturally in certain species. species sorry. Some reptiles, such as Komodo dragon, may be facultatively parthenogenetic. This is a Komodo dragon. That's not an actual dragon. But some scientists uh, concerned that if endangered reptiles like Komodo dragon is protected in single groups or alone, um, this may cause parthenogenesis, and parthenogenesis may cause a damaging effect on genetic diversity of the species. Komodo dragons are able to switch back to sexual reproduction after parthenogenetic events. This gives them a chance to colonize easily. And sharks. The bone head, um, the black tip shark, and the zebra shark are also able to reproduce by parthenogenesis. Due to fishing and environmental issues, the number of male sharks decreases and this causes parthenogenesis. This is a bonehead shark, a black tip shark, and a zebra shark. They are also lovely. Although parthenogenesis may help females who cannot find mates, it does reduce genetic diversity. Uh, in mammals, parthenogenesis in mammals doesn't occur naturally. Because after every parthenogenetic event, Offsprings would have XX chromosomes and this would increase the number of females. Despite this, scientists have successfully enabled parthenogenesis in some kind of mammals and in the birds. Parthenogenesis has been experimented on domestic turkeys, chickens, uh, domestic pigeons, and etc. In most cases, the egg failed to develop, 
normally or the dividing cells exhibited irregular uh, nuclei. The um, the oh okay then that's it. <laughs> I, I'm gonna say something but later. Rarely viable births result from this process and this can be increased by selective breeding, especially for turkeys. <coughs> However, male turkeys produced from parthenogenesis exhibit smaller testes <coughs> and reduced fertility. And the last one, uh, parthenogenesis also can be seen in snails, insects, platforms, and amphibians. That's it for me. Thank you for listening. Talk about artificial parthenogenesis. Since 1900, experimenters have been trying to manipulate and control their reproduction. They are trying to do that with some agents of change, like using chemicals and macromolecules, changing temperature, amount of salt, and pH, exposing eggs to individual hypotonic solutions of sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and calcium chloride, etc., simulating eggs with needles and opening little holes. Uh, the phenomenon of artificial parthenogenesis was accomplished by Jack Slope. He is the best known for his embryological work investigating parthenogenesis in invertebrates. He broke the first clear case with frogs, as is true with much of science some of Loeb's experiments were successful and many were not. In 1936, Gregory Pincus induced parthenogenesis in rabbit eggs. That was the first development of the parthenogenesis of mammalians. Uh, these are some examples. Uh, first of all, sea urchins. Sea urchins was uh, stimulated with using hypertonic solutions and then placing them in normal seawater. Uh, star starships was uh, starfish was stimulated with carbonic acid or natural seawater. Analysts with treating eggs with saponin followed by a seawater wash. Frogs with stimulating eggs with needle touches. And the last of all, the mammalian rabbits with temperature changes and chemical agents. Uh, what about humans? Can humans achieve virgin birth? The short answer is no. Parthenogenesis is common in a wide range of creatures, from FS to lizards, it can happen in mammals, except rabbits for now because of a phenomenon known as imprinting for an embryo to develop normally some genes have to be switched on and one set of the chromosomes are switched off in the other set uh, if unfertilized mammalian eggs start developing into an embryo these embryos either die at an early stage or turn into a nasty kind of tumor called teratoma so if humans one chromosome even becomes haploid it's called a psychological and pathological syndrome thanks for listening. Çektim beni de koyacaksın bak. <gülüyor>